here is the apparatus you'll need. A medicine bottle for the ether, which is fitted with a Bellamy Gardner dropper. The mask is a Schimmelbusch or other standard design. It has a spring band to hold the gauze in position. The gauze has been folded into 10 or 12 thicknesses. It's clipped into position over the mask. You'll also need a piece of Gamgee, 8 inches by 10, with a 4 inch slit in the centre. A piece of oiled silk or jaconet with a small hole in the middle. You'll want a tube of sterile Vaseline to lubricate the airways. This is a Waters metal airway, which is curved to fit the pharynx. It will be tolerated at a lighter depth of anaesthesia than will the older type of rubber airway. The nasal airway is an endotracheal tube cut to about five inches. This is transfixed by a safety pin to prevent it disappearing down the nose. It also is carefully lubricated before use. Other accessories include a gag, a swab holder, a bowl of gauze swabs, and a bottle containing liquid paraffin or castor oil to drop in the patient's eyes after the operation. Now for the patient. The most important points in preparation for an anaesthetic are rest in bed for 24 hours where possible, no solid food for four hours, and nothing to drink for two hours beforehand. Purging is unnecessary and only weakens the patient. Morphine and atropine are injected three quarters of an hour before the anaesthesia is due to start. The morphine acts as a sedative reducing the patient's mental anxiety and smoothing the course of anaesthesia. Both the morphine and the atropine prevent excessive secretion of saliva and mucus, which might obstruct the airway. A suitable dose of morphine is one-sixth of a grain for a woman, one-quarter of a grain for a man. These quantities must be reduced if the patient is gravely ill or if he's over 60 years old. Too large a dose slows up the anaesthesia by depressing the respiration. Of atropine, one hundredth of a grain is usually sufficient. Larger doses can be given, but they cause great discomfort. The time should be noted carefully on the chart. In three quarters of an hour, the premedication will have taken effect. The patient will be ready for the anaesthetic. Before starting, you must know all about your patient. Find out when she last had anything to eat or drink. If the operation is a hernia, ask which side it is. It may not be obvious when she's anaesthetized. Make sure that the heart and lungs have been examined and the urine tested, and that the premedication ordered has in fact been given in the correct amount and at the right time. The more nervous the patient is, the more difficult the induction will be, and a few kindly words will help a great deal. Feel her pulse and try to reassure her. Tell her exactly what you're going to do and what is expected of her. Encourage her to relax and try to go to sleep. Examine her mouth to make sure that there are no loose teeth or dental plates that might become detached and cause obstruction. Also see that there is a clear airway through at least one nostril.
place the Gamji over the patient's face. Tell her it's to protect her face from the anaesthetic. It also concentrates the ether vapour by ensuring that all the inhaled air comes through the mask. Make sure that her eyes are closed or the Gamji might come in contact with them and lead to conjunctivitis if nothing worse. Then place the mask in position. Always smell the ether before using it unless you've just filled the bottle yourself. Drop the ether onto the mask very slowly and cautiously at first to allow the patient to become accustomed to the smell. Ether vapour is irritating to the larynx and if it's given too rapidly at first it'll make her swallow, cough or hold her breath. If this happens, tilt the mask away until she's settled down and then lower it gradually again. Provided the breathing is regular, the rate of flow should be progressively increased until you're pouring it on. But don't soak the mask. The chief guide during induction of anesthesia is the breathing. With loss of consciousness, it alters, becoming irregular, deeper, and often noisy. It'll usually take 10 minutes to reach the second stage of anesthesia. Don't look at the eyes, or you may disturb the patient if she's not quite off. But this is what they would look like. The pupils very variable, usually small, and the eyes roving from side to side with a divergent squint. To speed up the induction, place the jaconet over the mask. Under this, carbon dioxide will accumulate. Breathing will deepen and the anaesthetic will be taken in more rapidly. The jaw is not relaxed and you can't put in an oral airway yet. If the breathing is not free, put the nasal tube down one nostril. As you saw, this is transfixed by a safety pin to prevent it disappearing down the nose. Speed up the flow of ether as fast as she will take it. Watch the breathing all the time. After another five minutes or so, there's a fairly sudden change to regular, so-called automatic breathing, which shows that she's down to the third stage of surgical anesthesia. You'll find the eyes fixed and central, with small pupils. The jaw is now relaxed, and the patient will tolerate an oral airway if you consider it necessary. As the jaw relaxes, the tongue falls back against the posterior pharyngeal wall and may obstruct the breathing. The artificial airway holds it forward, and proper support of the jaw will keep the breathing quite free. This is how you should hold the head, with the chin up and the jaw held forward by pressure behind the angles. You can keep your finger on the pulse in the facial artery where it crosses the lower jaw or in the superficial temporal artery in the angle between the upper border of the zygoma and the ear. The patient is now ready for operation but we'll continue and show what happens as anesthesia is deepened. Remember that as anesthesia progresses and the tissues become saturated, less and less ether is required to maintain a given depth. Listen always to the breathing. Any alteration in the automatic rhythm 
may be due to surgical stimuli in light anesthesia or as in this case to a change in depth of anesthesia. The patient is now in deep surgical anesthesia as might be needed for an upper abdominal operation. The pupils are larger. As anesthesia deepens, the intercostal muscles weaken and breathing is taken over more and more by the diaphragm. When they are fully paralyzed, the chest goes in instead of out as the diaphragm contracts, giving a seesaw effect. Provided the airway is quite clear, this is characteristic of deep anesthesia. This case shows it particularly well. Usually in the theatre, the anaesthetist must place his hand underneath the towels on the chest to be able to detect it. Ether, like any other anaesthetic, is a poison, and the less you give, the better. The experienced anaesthetist will vary the depth of anaesthesia to suit the various stages of an operation. For instance, this anaesthetist is lightening anaesthesia during the performance of a gastroenterostomy. The eyes are now eccentric with small pupils indicating light anaesthesia. He deepens it again in time for the closure of the abdominal wall, allowing a good five minutes for this. The eyes are now central and fixed, indicating moderately deep anaesthesia. And muscular relaxation appears to be adequate. However, for the beginner and the occasional anaesthetist, it's best to aim at maintaining a steady level of moderately deep anaesthesia with central fixed eyes and small pupils. This will lead to less post-operative vomiting than too light an anaesthesia with its risks of laryngeal spasm and retching.